So it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Hans Lemon, who's going to talk about the Leeds firm Bermontov's 1880 to 1914. Hans. Um, the title of my talk tonight, as you can see, is you know, the Leeds firm Bermontov's 1880 to 1914. And it has, of course, two quite specific dates in it. And they indicate really the lucrative heyday of the firm. And also it is a period which saw a tremendous different range of ceramic items produced. So within my allotted time, I want to give you a brief historical introduction to the firm Bermatovs and show you something of the wide range of products manufactured. When you visit the Bermatovs area of Leeds now, there is virtually nothing to remind you of the great ceramic factory that once dominated the area. What you see now are mainly 1960s tower blocks, and on one of them there is a blue plug with a few cursory lines about the history of the firm. It makes clear that the business there began in 1842, and that from 1880 onwards, it manufactured a range of products which were exported worldwide. In 1842, William Wilcock and John Lassie acquired land from a colliery near Nippet Lane in an area called Bermatos near Leeds. Both coal and clay were found on site and brick making began there in 1845. John Lassie died in 1858 and his widow sold her interest to the businessman John Holroyd in 1863 when the firm became known as Wilcock and Co. There are actually very few photographs of the Bermuda's works to date that have survived. But if you're standing, or when you're standing at what used to be Freehold Street back in the 1950s, you could actually see still the huge chimneys that dominated the Bermuda's works on your left hand side. And of course, there's also still a very uh, good photograph that was illustrated in uh, Peter Breer's book, Images of Leeds, that shows a close-up of the big kilns that were used to fire your bricks and sanitary pipes. A, a drawing in an article about Wilcock & Co. in the magazine The Architect of 1881 gives us a glimpse inside these huge kilns constructed of special fire bricks that could withstand great heat, and the bricks to be burned would be carefully stacked to allow the heat to circulate all round. And of course, the heat came from the coal that was burned below the flues in the floor. In the advertisement in the 1864 edition of Slater's directory, Wilcock and Coal were listed at fire brick and sanitary tube works, rock collieries, Bermantofs, Leeds, and they had a depot in Infirmary Street in Leeds. And as, as you can see, the focus was on what is known as the heavy clay industry. The things like bricks, floor quarries, sanitary tubes, chimney tops, and the like. In the 1870s, Wilcock & Co. branched out into the manufacture of terracotta and firearms for all sorts of architectural purposes for external and internal use. As is made clear in this catalogue, which is at present in the Bermatos archive at the Discovery Center in Leeds. The big change came in the period 1878-1879, when James Holroyd, the son of John Holroyd, who already had taken a stake in the firm in 1863, became the new manager. And he quickly steered the firm in a new direction 
And within 18 months, he had transformed what was essentially a local brick, terracotta, and sanitary pie business into a nationally known firm that produced high quality architectural terracotta, decorative tiles, and art pottery. He engaged services of reputable architects like Morris B. Adams, who was based in London, to provide designs for exterior and interior settings. He opened his own showroom in Charterhouse Street in London, where he could show his new products to attract wealthy London clients. And he also invited artists like Zaffold Davison, who worked as an illustrator for the magazine The Architect, to come to Leeds to make sketches of the firm's architectural fires, tiles and decorative pottery on show in the factory. The so-called zumbling sketches are revealing as they show that already by July 1881, Various new lines of ceramic products like pottery and fire sculptures were being manufactured, which were a far cry from the bricks and the sanitary pipes which had dominated production until then. Although the name Wilcock & Co. was kept on during most of the 1880s, the name Bermantofts became the preferred brand name. And this was consolidated in 1888 when the firm became known as Bermatoff's Company Limited. But shortly before Holroyd's death in 1890, he oversaw the incorporation of Bermatoff's into the Leeds Fireclay Company, which was set up in 1889. Um, and this was just a huge amalgamation of a number of West Yorkshire fire clay companies. Although Bermatov kept his own identity within this newly amalgamated business structure and continued to produce under his own brand name. James Holroyd died suddenly in 1890 and there is a memorial to his memory erected in the nearby St. Agnes Church on Stony Rock Lane, still there, with a simple inscription to the memory of James Holroyd, founder of the Bermatos Works, born January 10, 1839, died April 8, 1890, by his employees. The firm that James Holroyd created continued more or less in the same vein until the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, with the exception that the Bermatov's line in ornamental pottery was discontinued in 1904. The reasons for this are complex. Suffice to say that by the beginning of the 20th century, many competitors had come into the market and this line of business of making art pottery was no longer profitable for Bermatovs. And they, from then on, they began to concentrate much more stringently on the production of architectural fire and terracotta. To get some idea of the scale of the Bermatov works at that time, we can look at the Victoria history of the county of York in 1912, where the Bermatov branch is described as belonging to the Leeds Fire Clay Company and that they employ some 450 people out of a total workforce of 2,000 men. And of course, it also included women. Between 1880 and 1914, the Bermatos works produced four main lines of products. And that's what, they are the heavy clay objects like bricks and sanitary pipes. They made terracotta and fayans, decorative tiles, and art pottery. The so-called heavy clay products, like building bricks, ventilating bricks, sanitary pipes, chimney pots, and the like, were produced in huge numbers to satisfy the ever-growing Victorian building industry. These items were usually what is known as sold glazed. It is a glazing process 
that happens in the kiln during the actual firing. Common salt is thrown into the fire when the heat is at its height, which makes the salt volatilize, which then settles on the objects in the kiln in the form of a brown glaze. Salt glaze is waterproof, acid and dirt resistant, and makes for a strong and very durable product. The manufacturing of sanitary pipes, or suits pipes to us, as we call them now, was an extremely big business in the second half of the 19th century. And the laying of mile upon miles of sewage pipes on private and public land was seen as an important aspect in the various improvements in public health at that time. Bermatos made money out of this, and you know, for, 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 for a long period of time, the, the manufacture of this kind of material, including bricks, was really the bedrock of the firm. And of course, there was the production of architectural terracotta and faience. The difference between terracotta and faience is simple. Terracotta can be made from yellow or red firing clay and is left unglazed. Faience is glazed architectural ceramics and can have one or more colors. Most terracotta and faience products were press molded in plaster molds using malleable clay. And the impressions gained in that way were then fired, as you can see here, with the production of this terracotta letter. There are many fine examples in Leeds of Bermondorf's terracotta work. And uh, here is an extremely good one. The Grand Arcade opened in 1897. And in this section of the facade, you can see brickwork combined with terracotta work, as well as polychromatic faience. And there is the old medical school in Leeds that has inside very high quality and delicate, delicately molded interior faience you know, covered with a soft cream translucent glaze. And of course, if you like a drink, then the real gem is the garden pub in Hunslet, decorated on the outside with terracotta and faience, while inside there is this amazing ceramic faience bar, of which there are very few now left in the UK. In about 1908, Bermatov developed a new type of white finance material, which they call MAMO. And one of the first applications of this was in York in 1908, on the facade of G.W. Harding Linen Warehouse in Coppergate. In Leeds, there are many examples of white MAMO to be found really still throughout the whole city centre, but a really excellent example uh, decorated with very ornate faience sculptures is Atlas Chambers, built in 1910. Marmo became much in demand, not only in Leeds, but there was also a strong demand for it throughout the UK. Marmo, so-called, could be produced in more than one color, as can be seen here, uh, where a polychrome version of Marmo was used for the Michelin building uh, in London on the Fulham Road, which is still there, by the way. There was also demand for it abroad, and in Belgium, for example, houses faced with Bermatons, uh, Bermatons Marmo faience can be found. Functional and decorative tiles were also produced in great numbers and could be press molded, like you can see on the left, machine pressed, one in the middle, or they could receive very fine decorations applied with liquid slip, which is known by the French term barbotine. Press model tiles are often marked on the back, like this example here, and you can see they often bear, they often bear a BF monogram, of course, you're standing for Bermatos Fiance. Ornamental tiles were also used in fireplaces, as you can see here, where they created a fire and dirt proof surround. But the ornamentation, of course, would add a decorative effect to the interior of the room. In Gladhouse Hall, there is the most amazing bathroom where 
pavement of tiles coming to their own for their waterproof, as well as their ornamental qualities. And when you go to the Great Hall of Leeds University, of course, the grand staircase is decked out with hard-wearing pavement of tiles that also heighten the aesthetic quality of the whole entrance. But of course, tiles can also be used in a very effective combination with glazed architectural faience. Finally, there is Bermuda of Spottery, which was made in great quantities between 1880 and 1904 uh, for, of course, the well-to-do Victorian and Edwardian middle classes. At the mid-1880s, there was already an enormous variety of pottery for sale. Stylistically, it varies from extremely ornate to very simple, and size-wise from large to very small. It was either hand thrown on a wheel or a slip cast in plaster mold. Basic simple shapes could be enhanced by things like two handles, or similarly, the basic simple shape could be enhanced by a very exotic dragon that is being draped, surrounded by hand, and then finished off by, no doubt, a high quality artist. Very large items like jardiniers were popular for Victorian drawing rooms. And here is an interesting photograph of 1897. Uh, women are painting slip cast jardiniers, and in this case, they're actually painting one that was specially designed for Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. Pots usually carry marks and numbers on the bottom, which is now, of course, of great use to those who collect Bermudov's pottery as a private enterprise. And Bermudov also employed trained professional artists like Victor Kramer, and they would design molded decorations for plaques and plates, and they were often allowed to sign their work or use their initials. Harold Lietz was a painter employed by Bermatov, who excelled in the so-called barboutine technique. It is a matter of applying thin liquid slips onto the clay and he handled them as if they were oil paints. Well, we look at the French artist Bernard Sickard, who painted Bermudov's plaques. He almost used a French impressionist style, and he used to initial his creations uh, with the letters BS. Bermudov's pottery is now eagerly collected and can be found in many private and public collections. Leeds has a large show of Bermuda pottery at Abbey House Museum, and they have a small but very select display at Leeds City Museum. And more examples of Bermuda pottery can be found at Ludderton Hall. But of course, you know, since the early 1980s, when the study of Bermatov's pottery and faience material uh, you know, became uh, a more popular pursuit. We find that in 1983, the first time an, an exhibition was devoted to the history and the products of um, um, Bermatov's and Leeds, we find that Leeds and Bradford Museum Services got it together and they organized quite a big show it's traveled around, you know, there wasn't Bradford, there wasn't Leeds, but there's also, of course, accompanied by a highly informative catalog with erudite essays about the history of the firm. And the scholarship is taken further by people like Julie Gillen Root, who in 2004 and 2005 wrote a series of short articles about prominent buildings in Britain that were decorated with Bermuda of Fayance, like the National Liberal Club in London, the Midland Hotel in Manchester, and the first class refreshment rooms at Newcastle Central Station, which were enormous projects for the firm Bermatovs at the time. And more recently, in 2016, 
the Towson Architectural Ceramic Society devoted one of their annual journals to the subject of Bermudov tiles for decorative interiors. So here we are. I hope that within these short 20 minutes allotted to me, I have managed to give you some idea of the interesting history of the Leeds firm Bermudovs and the wide variety of ceramic products made between 1880 and 1914 that were not only used locally, but also found a wide market throughout Britain and abroad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans, for that fascinating talk. Uh, we have just about five minutes for questions. The people have thanking you in the chat column, but nobody's typed in a question yet. So while people are thinking about <laughs> questions, can I ask, why did it come to an end? Sorry, why? Why did the factory come to an end? It came actually, it, it's a sort of, it, it's, it has still a, like a long history in the 20th century. I think they actually closed the works finally about 1957, right? Um, but you find, of course, that the, the First World War was a major interruption in the first place. Now, that's why I make 1914 my cutoff point in a way, you see. And now you have this whole interwar period which is mainly devoted to architectural ceramics, garden ornaments, uh, terracotta, that kind of thing. Um, then, of course, the Second World War comes along, another major interruption. And, of course, then after the Second World War, building uh, styles begin to change, concrete glass comes in, and somehow architectural finance is no longer very popular. So they really began to struggle after the Second World War, and they had to close in the mid 90s. I'm looking at time because some questions, you know. There are some questions. So, uh, yes, I, I, I see. No, sorry, I, I'm, so I'm trying to see. I saw this interesting question about is the tell advertisement. I know there's a tell advertisement at the corner of Beijing Hall Street, Bermond no, I do not think it is. I know it's very nicely painted, you see, but it's probably by one of the Stoke and Trent manufacturers but not but not Bermatovs. Right and then suddenly Caroline asks could you please explain how marmo was made the slide mentioned eggshell is it glazed? Yeah yes obviously marmo uh, obviously it alludes to 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 the to the, to the, to the Italian sort of idea of marmo but but, but marmo is actually in, in, in yellow terracotta that had a very thick mutt white glaze, right, which is frost resistant and, you know, dirt resistant, you see. So, so obviously that, that became very popular because it, it, it tends to keep the building on the whole quite clean, right. But as I mentioned earlier, they could also add uh, colorants to the white and create thick colors like green, I think, pale blue, uh, like you find in the, um, you know, the Michelin factory uh, building on Fulham Road in London. Clive asked, is there a book about the Bermontos factory and its products? I think you showed us a book. Yeah, no, you, you see, the, 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 there is not, not yet, I would say, we say one great monograph on the Bermontos mm -hmm. pottery. It's scattered about a bit, you know what I mean, you see. So I think, I think the, 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 the great volume that tackles the whole subject and all the products still has to be written. 